need to go we need to go um protect habitat in the amazon most people haven't been there so that's foreign to them but this everybody has experienced it um so you have common ground to begin talking about this issue and collisions happen everywhere there is glass it does not matter um where the glass is if there is glass and there are birds you will have collisions um, in milwaukee the wisconsin night guardians for songbirds run by the humane society has been doing monitoring in downtown for a number of years um, this picture on the upper left here is at the milwaukee county courthouse uh, and that was one monitoring pass so each of those yellow arrows is a bird you may hear people say 599 million, you may hear people say 1 billion. Um, at ABC, we usually say up to 1 billion birds a year in the United States. Uh, the study that estimated the 599 million was, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting, getting over a cold. Um, that study was intentionally conservative. They left out the worst buildings because they didn't want to pull their averages up. Um, and then the data set that that was based on, it was published in 2014 based on data gathered by monitors over probably the previous 20 or so years. And every single year we build brand new buildings that have shinier, more reflective glass. So not only are we adding buildings, just in straight putting a building where there wasn't one before, but anytime someone replaces their windows, the old windows were not large sheets of glass and they were not coated uh, with energy efficient coatings, both of which make them more likely to cause collisions. So we're even taking the existing buildings and making them worse. Um, we often are asked, well, if there are that many birds, why don't I see more? Shouldn't I be stepping over piles of birds everywhere I go? Uh, there are a couple points to make on that. The first is that um, because this is spread out and there are well over 100 million buildings in this country, um, you, you don't get 50 birds all hitting at once. That does happen sometimes, but it is more spread out than, than that normally. Uh, there are also a whole host of animals that go and pick up the dead birds. Um, cats, raccoons, opossums, uh, even chipmunks and squirrels have been seen eating these. Other birds too, a lot of the collision monitoring programs in cities will look at the base of buildings and if they see seagulls in the bushes they know they need to get over there quickly because they're probably down there eating birds that collided um, that day we also aren't generally looking for these uh, most people walk around not staring at their feet but looking around them or unfortunately today looking at their phones um, the birds also fall in vegetation and fall in landscaping. They can fall on other rooftops. They can fall in the street. Uh, if you've got grating or grills in the, in the ground for ventilation systems, they can fall through those. Um, so there are more around. It's just that people are picking them up generally before people or something is picking them up before you see them. Uh, the birds that are colliding are generally songbirds. Uh, who are migrating overnight in spring and fall and then colliding during the day. Uh, collisions happen year round. So it's not just a migration issue, but migration is when we have more birds in our country than at any other time. So simply by virtue of that fact, and because they're not picking breeding habitat, they're stopping wherever their uh, fat stores run out, they stop. Um, and, and those migration flights. So they're not settling into the place they want to breed, which will not likely be a an area with a ton of glass, but they're stopping at the first trees um, that they, they get to. So they're in closer proximity to glass. Um, but this is a spring, winter, summer, and fall issue. Uh, also, other birds do hit too. Um, you know, ducks and vultures and raptors hit too. It's just they don't spend as much time as other birds around um, buildings. Uh, if you are asked which buildings are the worst, many people's first answer to that would be that it has to be the tall buildings downtown. Um, that is true if you look at the average number of birds killed per year, 24.3 per year killed by those buildings. 
Um, however, there just aren't enough of those buildings for that to add up to be a big part of the total number killed. Um, so if you fixed every high rise building, you would fix less than 1% of this collision issue. Um, so you can't just focus on the tall buildings. We really need all hands on deck. Um, and again, some of the buildings that were really, really bad in the study that produced these numbers were thrown out um, so that they didn't kind of bias the data by being outliers. But those outlier buildings are real and they exist everywhere and they're important. So these numbers could actually be viewed as um, slightly higher per year. Um, in looking at kind of what drives collisions and why we can prevent it, these two things are tied together. Uh, we have to figure out why it's happening in order to be able to prevent it. The number one rule with what makes something dangerous is that the more glass you've got, the more collisions you're going to have. Um, you can see that building in the middle, the Apple store. That tends to be the style that a lot of architects use today. Maximize the amount of glass that you can. Um, if you look on the building on the left, the black and white one, I'm guessing that building was probably built in the 70s, maybe the 80s, and it's about 50% glass, but what's there is shiny. If you look in the back right, there's a gray building there, which looks like it might be about a third glass, maybe a, a little bit less, plus or minus a couple percentage points there. Uh, but the glass that's there is perfectly clear. So it's not reflecting habitat at all. All glass is reflective, but the level of reflection is much, much lower on that one. So you can see how building trends and design trends are changing over time to make every new building worse than the buildings that were designed previously. Uh, in terms of the kind of like the actual issues that explain why a bird will hit glass, we talk about a couple things. Um, the first is that the glass can be reflective. So it shows the sky, it shows habitat, or it simply shows um, a potential flight path. So if you think about a building like in downtown at a T intersection that is at the top of the T, that building would reflect the street going back the other way. But that looks like a place for a bird to fly between the buildings. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be habitat. It just has to be um, a, look like a potential flight path. The second issue is that the glass can be clear. Um, so skyways are an, a good way to think about this to that to a bird flying through that there's no glass there's no obstruction there except for the railings in the bottom. Um, looking on the right, there are a lot of um, lobbies in larger buildings or atria in smaller buildings that are planted and that is great if you're sitting inside, but if you're a bird you're going to try and fly straight to those trees there so whether that glass is reflective or see through it's going to be dangerous because no matter what, uh, it looks appealing for a bird. Lighting is the third part of this conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, lighting is a bit complicated in terms of how it works. Uh, in general, there are two ways that we talk about lighting's influence on collisions and bird migration. The first is the, be the beacon effect, which is what's illustrated in this slide here. Um, when birds fly overnight, they are able to see the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and their ability to have their compasses work and orient based on that uh, is related to the kind of background light that the sky provides. And if you cast a bunch of artificial light in there, it starts to screw up the bird's compass. Um, and if there is a lot of bright light on a very dark background, things can really, really go haywire. So the lights there on the upper right are the World Trade Center Memorial. And if you look at the bottom left picture there, each one of those white dots is a bird that it's migrating and it's actually stuck in the beam of lights. So they have flown to the light, flown in, and they just keep flying there because um, they're stuck. Their compasses don't work and they have difficulty, as far as we know, flying out. There are uh, monitors that stand underneath those. And when a lot of birds get trapped, they can turn off the lights. And then I think it takes about 15 minutes for the lights to cycle off and then come back on again. 
And when they do that and the lights come back on, all those birds are gone. They've reoriented and continued on their way. Um, the photo on the bottom right shows kind of bad weather conditions. Um, so those are problematic for birds because they tend to fly lower when the weather is bad. So they're just simply their flight paths are closer to buildings and glass than they are when the weather is good. But also the, the light from those really bright lights is magnified by the moisture in the air. And so the light signature becomes much bigger um, than it is if it's just the building itself. However, this situation doesn't happen a whole lot, even though this is how people generally talk about light in collisions and uh, bird conservation circles. They talk about that aspect, but they don't talk about this one, um, where if I went into the city of Houston here and I turned off the lights on the five brightest buildings, you're not gonna make much of a difference. There is still a huge amount of light pollution coming from that city. And our goal is to not have the birds stop in downtown Houston, period. We want them to be where there are fewer buildings, fewer pieces of glass, more trees and more habitat. Um, there are also a whole host of other threats that are you know, really prevalent in very built environments too. Um, so we want the birds in the, in the green stuff, not in the, the totally urban areas. Um, so there is a field of study um, of ornithology where you actually you can use ra uh, radar data, like weather data, to study bird movements. For the birders out here, that's the bird cast stuff we look at to see how birds are moving overnight. Um, well, you can actually study those and look at how light pollution influences bird movement too. And they've found that birds are more likely to land in areas that are lit than in areas that are not lit. Um, and that extends even to like a freeway system that is not in a downtown area. So if you look at some of the kind of arterial freeway systems that go off the edges of this photo, birds are more likely to land along where there are freeway lights in a dark area than they are to land in the dark area. So that really gets at um, the scale of this. It's all of the lights. We got to turn off as many as possible and shield as many as we can. Um, and this is really what we at ABC think is the main lighting issue. Um, so it's good to have as many lights off as possible, but we really need a large approach. Um, in terms of how birds see the world, they see the world pretty differently than we see the world. Uh, this makes coming up with um, kind of the answers to why collisions are happening and what the potential solutions are, it makes it a bit of a challenge because we can't just go based on what we see. Um, most birds have eyes on the sides of their head, like this robin here. So they don't see very well ahead of them, um, which is in contrast to people and to primates. You can see on the upper right there, actually that's an owl monkey. I always have to put it in because it's the one with the bird name. Um, we have forward facing eyes. So we have binocular or stereoscopic vision, which means each field of vision from each of our eyes overlaps in the middle. And where there's that overlap, we have really good, high quality vision and depth perception. So we see ahead of us really well. If you look at the robin picture in the middle there with the beak pointing straight at you, that bird's eyes, you can't barely see them and the bird could barely see you. Um, it doesn't mean they see nothing in front of them. It's just most of what that robin uses to navigate around its world is visual information taken from you know, not quite, but nearly 360 degrees around it. So they can have an idea of what's coming behind them as well as what's coming in front. But a lot is based on what's happening on the sides. Um, this is not a perfect analogy, but I tell people, if you look straight ahead and you put your arms out to the side of you and you hold up, like say, just pick two fingers, you can see your hand, you can see that your hands are out there, but you cannot count those fingers if you're looking straight ahead. That's somewhat what it's like for the bird, but for the bird, the robin there, that's in front. Um, they have, it's better than, than that for the bird, but not a whole lot. 
Um, and then it's also important to point out that not all birds see that way. You can see the bald eagle on the bottom right there. That bird has binocular and stereoscopic vision, just like we do. And that eagle sees far, far better than people do um, looking straight ahead. However, um, raptors can still hit windows because they don't understand that the glass is not reality. So um, those birds do still hit windows where they are found in proximity to them. So the image on the upper left shows that kind of idea that birds can see the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, the bottom left shows contrast sensitivity. So the impact of the fact that most songbirds don't see very well in front of them means that they can't see contrast very well. So more or less, if you are showing that image there to a bird and to a person, we can see lines going much further to the right than a bird would be able to see because they don't see contrast the same way we do. So that means that any pattern you're going to put on a window that you want a bird to see, people are going to be able to see it. Um, it would be great if it was the other way around, but it's not. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff pattern wise that people can see that a bird cannot. There is one potential exception though with um, UV or ultraviolet light. There are a number of bird species and many passerines that can see UV light and people don't see that. Um, so you can see on the graph on the right there, um, these are the kind of the peaks of the wavelengths of light that a person on the top could see and a, a I think it was a starling for this study. Um, not all birds are the same and where their peaks are. Um, what that starling can see, and they have a, a peak out at 370 nanometers, which is in the UV. And that's something we just can't see at all. Um, so there is some potential to make collision products that are in the UV, but that gets a bit tougher because when we look at them, we can't see it. So while we can evaluate what like a, a white pattern will do because we can see it. It's tougher to know um, what's going on with the UV. Uh, the other cool thing I'll throw in is that you can see um, we have a peak in the blue and then kind of uh, some overlap in the green and yellow areas of our vision. But those birds, even in what is human visible um, light wavelengths, their peaks are really distinct. So they see combinations of colors that we do not see. So even when you're talking about color, um, it's different for a bird than it is for a person. Um, there is evidence that is increasing that birds can also see polarized light and use it to detect water. Um, but that's so like such a developing area of research that we're not really sure if it's useful for preventing collisions, um, but we're talking to people who are pursuing it. I also like to show this one for a little bit of a laugh, but also, um, let's see if it'll run. Oh, it's not running. That's a bummer. Oh, here it goes. So people think we can see glass, but we can't. So this woman here is just trying to leave the, the mall. So she's not texting. She's not talking to her friends. She's not messing with the kid. She didn't steal something and is running out in a hurry. All she wants to do is walk out the door and she can't do it. And that is because we don't actually see glass. Um, everybody here has hit their head on a sneeze guard or reached your hand out your car window and you thought it was open and bonked it on the window. We've all got an experience, at least one that, that way. So if I showed you the window on the right there, but I covered up the one that was open and said, tell me which one is open, you would struggle to do it. But if I show you this picture, it's really easy for you to tell me which one is open because uh, you can see the open window. So basically, we learn to pick up on cues in buildings that tell us that glass is there. And birds never, ever learn those clues, cues, excuse me. Um, so a bird will never judge whether glass is present or not based on what the architecture looks like. Um, you can see in the upper left there, that's the interior of an office building. A lot of places are now changing walls for glass walls. And you'll notice that there are two rows of dots there. One row about where an adult's eyes would be and one where a kid's eyes would be. 
those are most likely there to prevent people from smashing into those. Um, because even in the inside, people will run into glass. Um, and the same thing on the bottom picture, that kid there has already learned the concept of glass because if he hadn't, there is no way he would be standing leaning into that glass window. It's also important to point out that it's not just a traditional window that we're talking about. Um, glass railings, noise and wind barriers, which are more often every day being built as being clear. Um, even if you think about like at the top of a parking structure, when you come out, they put a, some of them now put like a little wind barrier so that the door doesn't slam shut on you. Um, if you make those clear birds hit those, even though it's a parking structure, because they go up and they think that that is the first area that they can go through and they hit that. They don't fly 20 extra feet above something clear. Um, so really it kind of needs an all hands on deck approach again with, you know, the glass that we're using and where building connectors are often the worst features. So if you've got a walkway that goes between two buildings, those are often, uh, really bad. In terms of finding solutions, uh, there was a researcher, a number of people have studied this and one of them came up with a, a tunnel in, in, uh, Austria. And ABC copied the tunnel design and started doing our own research. Um, the gentleman in Austria is also researching this exact same issue and we have some back and forth. Um, and basically we take live birds and fly them down the tunnel at products to see how well birds react, to see how well birds react to the product um, and avoid it. We have two tunnels. This one here is at the Powder Mill Nature Reserve in Pennsylvania. And we just opened a second one this year at Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory um, in Maryland. So those are banding operations that catch the birds and take all of their measurements and, and band the bird. And if the bird is in the right size range and is in good shape, it's not stressed out, we take it and then we put it down the tunnel and we fly it once and then each bird gets to go on its way. So they're not with us you know, a whole lot longer than it would take for them to be banded. And when you're the bird looking down the tunnel, this is the experience the bird has. Uh, they are put in a hole on the one end of the tunnel, which you see in photo one, and there's some black cloth that hangs down so light doesn't come shining in there. Um, then the bird is sitting in your hand in photo two, and you open your hand up, and the bird says, I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> and so they fly towards the light. Birds fly to, to light very often. That going towards the light is a, a common thing for a bird. Um, so the bird says, all right, look, I see light. I see sky. I want to get out of this person's hand. I'm going to go down the tunnel. Um, the third photo shows what those two openings actually are, though. Um, and those are two pieces of glass. One is perfectly clear, which is our control sample. And the other one has the pattern we're testing. Um, and we fly a minimum of 80 successful flights. So 80 different birds have done this um, down and record which way the birds go to give us an index of how well they're avoiding a product. Um, if they fly 50-50, it's random. If they fly 70% towards the clear piece and only 30% towards the test product, that means that test product gets a 30 in our rating scale. And we would consider that enough bird avoidance to be something we would call bird friendly. So the lower the score gets, the, the, the lower what we call a threat factor is, the better it's gonna work. So if you got a, something that was a threat factor of a five, that means only 5% of the birds flew at the product designed to prevent collisions and 95% went towards the clear piece of glass. So you know that almost all of those birds are seeing it and have time to react. Um, and then photo four, there's a little door on the side of the tunnel. And so every time a bird finishes, we open the door. Uh, there's a butterfly net there because sometimes we have to kind of help the bird find the door. Uh, the solutions, for collisions are tough because birds are really agile and they're also, you know, run a pretty big range of sizes. Um, and, you know, we want collisions to be prevented for all of them, not just for the big ones. Um, so birds really easily navigate tight spaces. Lab research has shown that birds know their 
when their wings are extended, they know the wingtip to wingtip length with about 6% accuracy. Um, so they know exactly how wide their wings are and they know, um, oops, sorry, I see I have to admit somebody here. Um, they know how big a gap they can fly through. They also know they can do what the swallow here on the right is doing and put their wings in all kinds of different positions to fit through openings. Um, the birds that would be flying towards this actually, if you assume the bird is approaching this at just say 10 feet off the ground, the bird sees that, judges how deep it is, and it knows that while it's in there, it can't flap its wings. So right before entering a, um, a gap like that, the bird moves from 10 feet to 13 feet elevation so that when it's going through that and it drops a couple feet, it comes out at about the same height at which it was initially approaching. So it's all really pretty amazing stuff. Um, and then if you think about a bird going in and out of a nest hole, a uh, nest cavity, they don't hang around and advertise that they're, all their young are stashed in there. They go in and out pretty fast. The same thing with foraging or um, flying from a predator through forest or trees or conifers. Um, because birds' bone, bones are hollow, uh, there is really strong selection pressure for them not to run into stuff. So they have gotten to be very good at navigating, which makes it tough to figure out what kind of a pattern you can put on a window that will actually be something a bird won't think it can fly through. Um, so you could think if you put a pattern that was eight feet, had eight feet gaps in it, an eight foot gap to a bird is nothing. There may as well not be anything on that window at all. Um, where this research has led us is that you know, the pattern needs to be visible. Um, and we talk about a two inch by two inch rule. It used to be a two inch by four inch rule where we say, whatever your pattern is, it should have no more than two inches between the pattern elements, whether they're horizontal or vertical. For the pattern to work as lines, they should be at least an eighth of an inch thick. And if they're dots, they should be at least a quarter of an inch in diameter. And the bigger you make them, the more effective they will be. Um, and you can see what that translates to here with just like a line pattern. Um, those rules I just kind of quickly ran over are just meant to be like the, the guaranteed to work kind of rules. You can do all kinds of other things that don't necessarily follow that perfectly that can be effective at reducing collisions, but we can't tell you that will work. We have to let the birds in the tunnel tell us that stuff that deviates from these rules will work. Um, one promising area is irregular patterns. So if you, you know, the lines here are regular, it's a perfect repeat. Um, and if you're a bird, that means that you have a better ability as you're approaching that to judge whether or not you think you can fit through because it's not confusing at all. Um, whereas if those patterns were a big tangle of lines that didn't have clear gaps that were repeating, for the bird approaching that, it's more confusing and might be a stronger deterrent. Um, that's kind of a new area where this is going. In terms of actually taking this kind of information and making solutions and preventing collisions, there's really two ways to do it. Um, the first is to work bird-friendly bird building guidelines and materials into new construction. You can do that by passing an ordinance using a guideline or a policy. And then the second is fixing or what we call retrofitting existing buildings, including homes. Um, really, we need both. If all we did was new construction from here forward, all we do is hit pause on that up to a billion birds a year dying until you've replaced every existing piece of glass. So that's not really an acceptable solution here. We need to get all new buildings built correctly and we need to find the worst windows on the worst buildings and fix those um, quickly too. To go into each of these just very quickly, um, there are a number of places that have passed mandatory ordinances. Um, New York City is highlighted there uh, because they have the best one so far. Uh, you'll notice Madison, Wisconsin is on there as well, although the um, that Excuse me. 
their ordinance has been in effect since I think it was late 2020. However, the conservative and libertarian group will in Wisconsin has sued the city. So even though it is not, there hasn't been an injunction to you know, make them stop enforcing it, um, it is currently in court. Uh, that's going to play out over a, another year or two, I would guess, but I'm not a lawyer, so that is just totally a guess. Um, so Madison has one. There are another number of other communities that I have talked to in Wisconsin about whether they would want to adopt one, um, but everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens and if theirs would be null and void uh, based on that suit. Uh, at the bottom there, there's a question about what about voluntary guidelines? If I put the number of places that had adopted a voluntary guideline to their municipality, this list would get a lot bigger. Um, but we at ABC generally aren't in favor of that because it takes a lot of work even to do that and to create the guidelines and get it adopted. And then really nobody looks at them. Um, so you really need to make this kind of design mandatory. So the goals of an ordinance are to reduce the amount of glass. Um, remember, that's the one thing that underlies all of this. So you want to reduce the total amount where possible and the exposure of it. So if you do use glass and you put something like a solar screen or a grill or something called a double skin facade, assuming it's not just glass on the second facade um, in front of the window, then you're fine because that window is basically um, covered up from a bird flying into it. Um, the reduction in the amount of glass is difficult, um, but it's something that you know, some of the different ordinances will say, well, for buildings that are over 50% glass, you have to do A, B, and C, where if you're under 50%, you don't have to do anything. So that pushes designers who are thinking about a 60% glass building to make a 49% glass building so they don't have to do anything else. Uh, the 49% glass building is not bird friendly for sure. Um, it could still kill tons and tons of birds, but it's better than if they had had another 11% of glass um, in the structure. Then when you do use glass, make as much of it bird friendly as possible. Um, and you wanna focus that bird friendly glass on the lower floors. So most birds spend most of their time, you could think about the height of the mature vegetation in the area, and then maybe double it. Most birds spend most of their day in that kind of a range. So if you've got 30 foot high trees and a 400 foot tall building, I would worry about the bottom 60 feet and not so much about the top floors of that building because most of the birds won't be up there very much of the time. Uh, and then the ordinance should also include renovations that replace glass. So if you've got an existing building and you are changing the glass for any of the many reasons that people do that, um, this the law should apply to you too for birds. Um, so New York City requires that you use 90% of your glass be bird friendly up to 75 feet from the ground. And that's every building. So a house in Brooklyn and a skyscraper in Manhattan are all included and it includes glass replacement. If you're interested in learning more about this, ABC's new collisions website has a page for ordinances and guidelines where we've got our model ordinance, which we're revising right now, um, and all the kinds of information you could want uh, to do this. And if you are going to try and do this where you are, you know, feel free to give us an email um, and we would be happy to help advise your effort. Um, so our model ordinance is 100, 100, 100. So we wrote it for 100% of the buildings to have 100% of bird friendly glass up to 100 feet high, uh, up to 100 feet from the ground. Nobody has ever done an ordinance like that. And so we have in all of that extra guidance kind of written ways that you can soften that up and work down to where you want to be um, in your community, as opposed to starting lower and then having people walk that lower starting point further back. Um, we're kind of going with what the ideal would be, and then realizing there won't be many places that would actually do that. So helping people get what they would be comfortable with. Um, we don't include lighting at the moment. Uh, we're gonna probably next year develop a separate lighting policy. Uh, existing buildings have different issues than buildings that aren't built yet. Uh, you can't usually change the materials. So unless you are changing your glass anyway, most 
people's buildings, the glass is the glass and you have to do something to it or with it. Um, cause you're not gonna, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars replacing your windows simply to reduce collisions. Um, there's cost. So the different products cost different amounts, depending on what you'll consider and the amount of area you need to cover. Same thing with effort to install them. And some of them need to be replaced. Um, and there are a lot of variables that influence collisions. Um, this is one window at different times of the day. So we talk about if you know you've got a bad window, you can go outside and look at the window and try and figure out why birds might be hitting it and then pick your solution to pick something that would be as visible as possible given you know, what's happening at your bad window. However, the fact that at some times of the day, the window or some times of the day and different angles of approach and different weather conditions, the window can look perfectly clear show sky, show trees, have different levels of brightness of habitat reflection. It can be hard to know exactly what your issue is. Um, so sometimes you just pick one of the solutions and they should all work. You just might get a little bit extra boost from some of them if you did that kind of look around your building. Uh, a lot of them have um, being built now are talking about doing green rooftops, which are great, um, both for energy and water conservation and reducing the size of the sewers we need when it rains a lot. Um, but also because birds that are migrating use this as habitat. Um, there are studies that found a surprising number of birds in on green rooftops in Manhattan during migration. Um, but it's not a good idea if you put a big glass uh, bird killer in the middle of it. So where you have these and greenhouses and things like that, um, some planning for birds is warranted. There's also something called channeling, uh, where you have basically created a flight path for birds. Um, and this can work a couple different ways. You can think of like at this example here, which I think is the Tracy aviary, um, birds would fly between the vegetation down that walkway. And if there's a glass window at the back of that, they're going to fly smack into the glass window and you basically created a funnel into the window. Um, this can also work where the vegetation itself is the funnel. So if you've got like a line of street trees that all end at a building with a glass wall that reflects those street trees, you're basically encouraging the birds to fly along those trees and then into the window at the end. Uh, planted courtyards and atria are also an issue. Birds flying over will see that and say, oh, hey, look, and drop down in there, forage and hop around for a little while. But instead of flying straight up to go out, they look around and they see the vegetation reflected in those windows um, and often will just fly straight into the windows. Uh, these can be problematic. It doesn't even have to be a courtyard. If you've got a building corner, so if you've got an L-shaped building or a U-shaped building, um, birds will fly into those corners and kind of have extra trouble because they get stuck and confused. Um, so those windows are, are often some of the worst. So we talk about a number of different steps for existing buildings. Um, you know, our goal is to fix the bad windows and leave the rest alone. Uh, if you want to do all of your windows, that's terrific. And we love it. They all could potentially be a threat to birds. But the reality is most people aren't going to be willing to even take step one if the ask is that they go put a retrofit on every window. Um, and we're realistic, we're pragmatic. Uh, so we're starting from you know, asking people to do something realistic and pragmatic. Um, so our step one for your home or your property is to do lights out during migration. So really you need the lights off from you know, midnight or 1 a.m. until the following night. You need to let those birds fully finish their migration and land. Um, before you turn the lights back on. So if you turn them off at midnight and you turn them back on at 5 a.m., you're not fixing the problem because they're back on as birds are starting to try and drop out of their migration flights and figure out where to be. Um, you can shield all of your lights too. So if you've got a light that you need to leave on for security, you make sure that the light doesn't go up and doesn't go sideways, that it's all focused down um, and that should help too. Then, you know, pay attention to your windows. So if you have ever heard a bird hit one of your windows, 
you can put that on your to-do list immediately because um, you haven't heard all of the collisions there for sure and there will be more. Um, and then if you don't wanna act right away, you can pay attention and listen for bird collisions for a while. Um, there's nothing, you should probably just go ahead and do any that you've heard right away, but then you keep paying attention. Um, you come up with your plan and your solutions, which we'll talk about in a second. You install them on your windows and then you keep paying attention. And every time you hear a bird hit a window, you put something on that window and pretty soon you'll have done a handful of your windows and fixed almost all of your collision problems. Um, and even though step one in this is lighting, the glass is far more important to do than the lighting. Um, the lights are, are good and they're a relatively easy fix and they save you money by having them out and be more efficient. Um, but the glass is really, is really the key here. Um, and lighting does operate even like out in the suburbs too. Um, there were studies that showed birds acting differently during their migration flights, whether they were flying over a, like a, a green space, a nature reserve, or the street lights in the housing you know, areas right next to it. So even at that level, um, lights influence birds. Um, if you're gonna do a little bit larger monitoring, I'll do this quickly. Um, there are a number of recommendations we've got. You would want to pick your your target buildings and walk the same route every single day you're gonna monitor. So you can build a consistent data set um, and monitor as much as possible. And if you've got a team, then the team can divide up the days. Um, and you wanna record exactly where birds collided. Um, too much monitoring is, well, at building A, I found 10 birds today, but they don't tell you where at building A. So then if you are gonna to go to try and retrofit that building, you're stuck with looking at the whole building. Um, whereas of those 10 birds, you know, maybe 80% of the birds they pick up hit 10% of the building. And we would say, we'll do the 10% and see what happens. Um, and this is work we did with Northwestern in Chicago. And the percentages are the percentage of the collision victims that they picked up at each of those different building parts. So like the Allen Center in the middle there, you can see half of the birds hit about 5% of the building. Um, so if you've got a fixed budget for doing this kind of work, um, it's far better to get the really bad parts of three or four buildings than it is to do all of one building. Uh, so again, we mentioned trying to figure out what the issue is and coming up with a plan based on that if you can you know, add any information at all. Um, and then you have to kind of figure out what your solution is gonna be. Um, the part on the bottom is highlighted yellow because putting a solution on the outside of the glass is always the best. Um, if you put it on the inside, it might not work so well because um, the reflection of the glass will basically make the pattern on the inside invisible. So if you've got like a third story window and you have no option but to put something on the inside, try the inside, but you're gonna probably have to make the pattern stronger than you would. And you would also wanna go outside and see if you can even see it from outside um, as kind of a guide. But wherever you can do this, the outside is always the, the best option. So now to kind of run through some of the ways you can prevent collisions. Um, an insect screen or a solar screen will make a window bird friendly pretty much by itself. So you can see the difference in the reflection in those two windows uh, is massive. Um, if you then considered, well, what if it was not reflective, but it was see-through and the bird could see it out the other side of the building, the darkness of the screen really decreases the viability of how well you can see, especially when you add space on the interior of the building. So those screens really do a good job. You can get them with suction cups that would just suction cup those on your windows um, and you're pretty much done. Uh, if the bird's not going terribly high speed and is smaller, uh, it can give it a little bit of a cushion if it does still fly into your window. Obviously, if it's like a Cooper's Hawk, it's going to go right through that screen and hit the window just the same. Um, so the screens today are now pretty often built to be only a 50% screen. So you got a storm window that goes up and down and the screen is only half of it. And 
in the summertime in Wisconsin, which is like what, nine weeks, <laughs> when those screens are down on the outside, half the window is bird friendly, the other half isn't. But then when it's too cold to have your windows open, you slide the storm down and the way the windows are put together, that storm goes back on the outside of the screen. So basically the screen is now not helping. Um, if you ever take those storms down, you can actually change the order that those pieces are in there. So that screen half will stay on the outside 365 days of the year. And if you get new windows, replacement windows, you're building a new house, you can ask for full exterior screens and they will still give them to you. Um, of those two, of the picture on the left, on the right-hand side, if you look at the bottom window there, you can see three pieces of black tape that are uh, horizontal on the bottom pane of glass. And this is what we talk about in terms of looking at your problem. Uh, so those black lines, if you cover the window in them spaced appropriately, would make a difference. But they would make a much, much bigger difference if you picked white or gray tape for that setting because it's gonna show up better against the, the reflection. However, if that window is reflecting sky or water, the black tape would probably show up better against the lighter background than if you picked white or gray tape. Um, so anything you pick is gonna make a difference, but you might be able to really maximize the difference by taking a minute and considering what the likely issue is. Uh, on the right here, you see tempura paint at a nature center. Uh, that is a great option. If you've got little people you're educating, like at River Edge, um, it's also great if you've got kids at home and want projects or you want to decorate your window seasonally. Uh, but for a lot of people, they would never consider something like that. But if you do it, do it on the outside, and it can be a really fun project. American Bird Conservancy makes a product which is about to be back on the market called Bird Tape. Uh, and it's basically translucent tape that goes on the outside of your window. And if you follow the spacing rules, that will be effective. Um, it's pretty easy and inexpensive. We put this up at the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory's former office at Forest Beach, because there was a bank of windows there that had trouble. Um, and it made a massive reduction in the amount of collisions. There's another product called an Acopian Bird Saver. Um, and that's on the of the three windows on the left here, it's on the middle one, but not the two to the sides of it. And it's basically, you hang a rope in front of your window on the outside. And those ropes dangle down and the birds see the rope. And then those may get, have a little bump up in effectiveness because it's a 3D solution actually hanging in front of the window. Um, and the thicker you make those ropes, the better they will work. Um, the Acopian website, you can order them from Acopian, but they also have downloadable directions on how you can build these yourself. Um, so you can really make this totally customizable. Uh, they're not in it for the money, they're in it for the birds. Uh, there are bird crash preventers, which are about to be go out of business and not be available anymore, uh, which is basically like a monofilament line in front of the window. And we think part of the reason those work, you know, might be the physical obstruction because um, they're not highly visible. The two most, probably the two most widely sold options are these UV types of decals, which you see in the bottom middle and on the right. Um, they can be effective if you put enough of them up and you put them on the outside. So too often people will have like a 20 square foot picture window and pop over to the bird store and buy two of these and put them on their 20 square foot window. Well, you've taken care of like two little tiny sections of it, but the rest of the window is the same. So the more you put up, the more effective they will be. And you also need to read the box carefully because they wear out. Um, the UV materials that these products are made of aren't that long lasting. So you need to buy more and replace them. And they're kind of expensive each. Um, so this can add up quickly if this is what you put up. Um, the ones on the right to the bird's eye view, I think they recommend you put them inside the glass um, and they might still be effective there, but they will certainly work better if they're outside. Now, there's another product called Feather Friendly, which are basically little white dots that go on your window. Um, 
and these are effective at reducing collisions. You can get it either as a full sheet of window film or a do-it-yourself version, which comes basically as a roll of tape. And you put the roll of tape across your window, run a credit card across the back of the roll of tape, and then you pull the tape off and all that's left on your window are those dots. Um, so you still get really good vision and view out the window and it covers about Eight per, under a little bit under eight percent of the surface of the glass. Uh, there are all kinds of different vinyl window films, whether they create a regular pattern like you see on the left there, or irregular patterns like you see in these uh, uh, other two in the middle and the bottom. Um, pretty much whatever pattern you ask for, a window film company can make if you're ordering enough of it, especially. Uh, there's another product called Kaleidoscape, which is more or less the kind of material that they put ads on bus windows on. You can see out fairly well, but from the outside, it looks like a solid surface. Um, and you can get this in different colors too. Uh, netting works, especially if you kind of have an emergency, you need to just take care of something and get something up quickly. Uh, but it's gotta be the right kind of netting. It's gotta be really taut and tight because uh, if it's loose, birds will get tangled in it. And it also has to be thick enough that the birds can see that there's something there because you don't want them just slamming into the net. Um, to show a couple of types of new glass um, and some of the patterns we're talking about, there are a lot of ways to make a pattern on glass that bird can, a bird can see. We won't go into the technology here. I can answer questions if you've got them. Um, but we are also working to encourage novel patterns that follow our rules. So we're working with a researcher at Carnegie Mellon University on taking what we know about what birds can see and putting it into a computer algorithm that will then create patterns that follow the rules that aren't just lines and dots. And we're gonna be putting together a booklet of 50 of these along with the instructions to actually you know, do them yourself. Um, and then you can tweak and change them and the idea is not that it has to be these 50. It's just that people can think outside of the box and they don't have to use the same kind of lines and dots that everybody else does. Um, and then here are some of the, the glass products from inside and outside. So you can kind of see that this doesn't really hurt your vision and pretty quickly you don't even notice that they're there. Um, so this is a horizontal line pattern. This is a product called Scene. Um, they are kind of reflective metallic dots. I'm not positive if they're going to make a do-it-yourself or a homeowner window film version, but at the moment it's like a new glass product. And you can see you can't, you can't even really tell those dots are there um, looking out the window. This is etched glass on surface one, which is on the outside. Um, and this is meant to be a design element. So they want you to see the pattern in this one. Um, but it's interesting, it's intricate, and etched glass actually looks really, really cool from the outside when you've got the lights on at night. It creates a, a really elegant pattern. Um, this is another company in Chicago that produces different etches, and this is the same kind of thing with the window films. You can create a pattern and, and they, can, they can make it for you. Um, lastly, we'll just talk about um, the UV new glass. So because people can't see UV light, um, the architects who are designing the big you know, buildings for tens of millions of dollars, they want the glass clear if they can get it clear. Um, and there are a number of glass companies that have created UV glass products that actually have gotten you know, good enough scores in our tunnel to be considered bird friendly. Um, they have to have a pattern in the UV. It can't just be solid UV. Um, because that's only one of the like bands of light that birds are seeing. And we don't really know how, how strong it is for you know, bird navigation relative to the other bands of light that they see. Um, so you can't make it pattern free because the bird doesn't show up to the bird is what it seems like. Uh, you can't use it as, excuse me, you can't use it freestanding either. So if you want a noise barrier or a railing, um, this does not work for that. Again, I won't get into the details of it. It's got to be installed in a building. And these also are all very expensive. So if you're talking about buying a new glass product, the UV is always the most expensive one you can choose. 
Um, and then not all birds see UV light. So if you've got a problem with like say morning doves hitting your windows, they don't see UV light. So you would spend all this money, put these up and those birds are gonna keep hitting your windows anyway. Uh, so I will leave you with a link to our website, which is birdsmartglass.org. Uh, we launched a new collisions website and we're adding features to it. So we're hoping it's kind of a one-stop shop uh, for collisions information for you. Uh, on that site, you can find our bird-friendly building design PDF, which is about a 77-page book, I think, that talks about a lot of this stuff. Um, and if you're not a member of ABC, I would invite you to follow that link at the bottom and join us. So I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'm happy to answer them if people have them. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Yes, I think we still have a few minutes for questions. I want to thank you again for hanging in there with our issues with the computer and also with your cold. So I think the you put into this program, I'm going to um, ask the, the participants to unmute themselves and go ahead and ask some questions. Um, we did have a, a question prior to this program starting about the, um, the new solar arrays that are going in everywhere and um, are there issues with uh, avian um, problems with them backing into these new solar arrays? And what could be done about them? So that is an area that kind of conservation wise, um, I've taken up a little bit. Uh, the short answer is it's complicated. I'll see how short I can really make a satisfactory answer. Um, solar is generated in two ways. They either point mirrors at a big tower and boil something in the tower and use that to turn a turbine. Um, but that only happens in a handful of locations. Those have a different set of issues than the photovoltaic arrays, which are what almost everybody is doing everywhere. So I'm just going to skip the first one and focus, focus on the photovoltaic arrays. Um, those are problematic if they put them in good habitat, just because you're losing habitat. However, uh, any energy source we use comes with habitat costs. So focusing too much on stopping those only because of habitat you're just you know, shifting where the habitat loss is. So putting it in developed or degraded areas um, is the best. You know, Some places like, oh, well, the farmers aren't selling their land and there's no abandoned Walmart, so we're gonna cut down this wood lot and put it there. And we prefer it wouldn't go there. <laughs> um, but those arrays actually, because they're shiny and they're black, they polarize light and birds can see polarized light. So um, there's something called the lake effect hypothesis where people think that birds flying over see that huge thing of polarized light and think it's water and try and land on it. And that happens here. Our friend uh, Marge Gibson at the Reggie talks about birds that she gets brought into her that have tried to land on wet fields or wet highways because they're black and they're shiny when they're wet. And so the migrating birds will think, oh, there's a stream and get totally busted. And, you know, if you're a loon, you can't take off if you're on concrete. Someone has to come pick you up. Um, however, that's not the only thing that's going on with those because the, the USGS is researching them right now and doing a study. And, you know, I'm on the periphery of that group, but I'm in it. Um, and they're finding that not only water birds are hitting, but songbirds are hitting too. And there are not songbirds that are going down hoping to land on the water. So there's some more complexity in that than it's just being confused for water. Um, but it still does probably all things considered a huge grain of salt here because this is again like kind of a brand new area of research. Um, but it looks like it probably is going to be the safest energy generation technique for birds in terms of habitat and direct mortality. Um, the best thing about solar is you can use it in distributed fashion. So you can put it on your rooftops, you can put it above the parking lot, you can put it, you know, they're actually building solar glass so that the facades of the buildings themselves will generate energy to power the building. And that is by far the best because you don't get a big, huge field of them. Um, and then just the one last cool, interesting, and also unfortunate thing about solar is that birds aren't the only animals that see polarized light. 
insects see polarized light too. And if you're an insect that lays your eggs on water and you've got photovoltaic panels near you, they preferentially pick the panels to the water because the panels polarize light better than water. So it's like a hyper stimulant. And there's some kind of potential solutions for how you address that problem. But um, the siting is important because you don't want to put a big photovoltaic utility next to a wetland because you're going to cause an, an insect drop probably. And these are all like small studies. So again, nothing like when we're talking about 599 billion million birds, like not that level of research, but um, still some stuff to maybe guide us going forward. So we, we are talking about that and working with the USGS people on their study because um, they do the study, but they can't then go like make people listen to what they found. That's where, that's where we come in. So when that comes out, hopefully in a year or two, we'll be, we're ready. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but it's uh, interesting and you don't ever hear anything about that one. That's so true, but it's, it's very important research and information for all, all of us to have. So is there anybody else that um, still is on this program, um, do any of you have questions? Yeah. All right, go for it, Joan, if you have a question. You have to unmute yourself. Got it, got it, got it, thanks. Yeah, I put my little hand up. Um, I wanna give you a high five. <laughs> <laughs> this is reverting 180 to the lowest of low tech. And I just wanted to ask you a question about effectiveness. Um, this idea came from a Wisconsin Nature Center, not, not River Edge, of hanging strings of found turkey feathers down from the tops of the windows during the season. Of course, they would waft in the breeze. And I have finally collected enough turkey feathers, found turkey feathers to make my strings, but I'm not going to launch the project if you say that that would be ineffective. Uh, if you put enough of them up there, it should work. And the fact that they dangle and move around in the wind might actually be better because again, it gets at that kind of irregular idea as opposed to being like a perfectly straight line. If it's moving around a little bit, it's gonna be harder for a bird to judge and the turkey feathers are also significantly wider than the types of lines we're talking about. So, you know, if they're two or three inches across, that's far bigger than the eighth of an inch or quarter inch we talked about for a line or a dot. So that's going to show up to a bird from a lot further away. Because um, you think about a bird approaching a window, there's really a couple levels of decision making. One from like 30 feet away, do I go there at all? And if they choose to approach, continue to approach it, um, you know, that means they're not seeing anything that would be an issue. But if they see the turkey feather from 30 feet away, they might not even choose to get any closer to the window than that. Um, but if they're closer, the closer they get, that turkey feather is going to become more and more visible. And because it's bigger, you're going to give the bird more time to react to like needing to turn. Um, cause there is a bit of an issue if the bird's flying fast enough and the pattern shows up only when the bird's 10 feet away, there might not be enough time for it to correct fully and avoid the collision. So I would encourage you to do it. Um, and again, just pay attention to what happens. And if you, you know, if you have a 10 foot wide window and you put up one string in the middle, you're just going to shift the collisions to the sides, but one string is better than no strings. So, um, yeah, put up as many as you think you, you can be happy with. Well, as many as I've found so far, I'll put in strings and see what happens. I've, we've got pictures of somebody who did the same kind of a thing, but with pine cones. Oh, and yeah. They, they hung pine cones up and let them. And he said he did it at his home. I think he's in Arizona and said the collision stopped. Oh, great idea. So, Thank yes, you. De definitely get creative. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I will. Sure. And let us know how it worked out. You know, give us a, a call or send me an email. It'd be oh, wonderful to find out how, how your experiment works. And, and then we'd be able to recommend it for other people too. And well, so it's a good winter project, making turkey feather strings so that I'm ready to go in the spring. Oh, like a great idea. Anybody else with a question before we um, end the program here today? 
All right. I don't see any more hands up, and I, I guess uh, others are still there, but um, but no questions. So I want to thank you again, Dr. Lance, for you know please presenting to us here today, um, and again putting up with our, our uh, computer issues. But I want to remember remind everybody that the next program um, doesn't occur until January because of the Christmas holiday. So the next program will be January 13th at one o'clock, and uh, Dr. Jim Reinhardt from the, the UWM Field Station will be presenting on a winter plant ecology or what are our trees doing in winter, essentially. So please join us for that and have a great holiday season. And again, thank you all for joining us and especially our presenter, Dr. Lentz. So see you all in the new year. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. Go treat a window. Yeah, you are, Mary. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Lentz. Great New Year's resolution. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.